Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the, a macho way to talk, it looks like. Um, this is our, our first of the two distinguished ESPM talks. Um, I wanted to remind uh, you quickly, this, this, these two individuals um, have been selected through a nomination process. And um, I'm very happy to see that this has become really um, a tradition for the department. And I remember somebody when we started this about a decade ago said, oh, this is just a popularity context. And I say, yes, it is also. I remember I told her, yes, it is a popularity contest in some way, because we also have to be you know, popular and be able to communicate our science. Um, and so you know, you're not really completely wrong in stating that, but of course there is so much more substance here. Um, and so without further ado, I will let Paolo say a few words, our chair, and then Claire and Tim, who have been working with, um, with IDE, are gonna introduce her. Paolo? Thank you, Matteo. So Matteo asked me to give us a, a brief introduction to the uh, distinguished uh, lectures, uh, to give some more solemnity to the event, uh, even though I'm not a great, uh, uh, great at giving that uh, solemnity, but uh, I just wanted, uh, this is a tradition that started in Eston before I arrived. And my understanding is that it was motivated by the desire to hear from, not only from external speakers, but also from members of the community and uh, uh, give the opportunity to some members of the community to display their work and present their work. And uh, both from the graduate student and the uh, faculty uh, groups. And so, um, uh, of course, there are other opportunities for the graduate students to present their work. Grad Fest is one of them. This year it will be again in a different format, unfortunately, because of uh, the pandemic. And uh, uh, there will be more messages about that. So I don't have much more to add other than congratulating ID for. Um, uh, being selected in the, this process, and uh, I'm looking forward to listening to her talk. I think, and after me, she will be introduced by uh, her advisor. Hi, I'm Claire Kremen, and um, I've had the privilege of being IDE's uh, PhD advisor along with Tim. And uh, so great to see so many people here from so many places. It's really fitting. I want to say that as I sat down yesterday to think about what to say about IDE. Uh, I realized I was getting really emotional, so I might tear up a little bit. Uh, I just feel so proud of her, but even more so, I'm, I am truly grateful to Ide for the opportunity to have been part of her intellectual journey as she's continued to develop her scholarship and her activism during her graduate career here at ESPM. And I say continue because when she came here from University of Wisconsin, she was already doing so many different things. Uh, in both in terms of research and, uh, and, and her work in so many different ways. She is a leader and she leads in a quiet, persistent, thoughtful, dedicated, conscientious and graceful manner. She is a true interdisciplinary scholar and someone who contributes profoundly to any endeavor that she's a part of. And something that um, you probably all know is that she does uh, really complex uh, dissertation work that blends a lot of different fields, including soil science, pollination ecology, molecular lab work, and heavy duty statistical modeling. But you might not know that while she was doing all this stuff, she's also been working on several side projects, um, analyzing uh, interview data and socio-ecological data in conjunction with several large research teams, both at Berkeley and also um, with Sink, And somehow, somehow she's found time to do all this heavy lifting and research, but she also mentors, um, has mentored high school students and undergraduate students since her very first year, including several students that wrote senior theses and a large number of students from underrepresented minorities that she's trained while integrating them into her research. And of course, she's done a lot of teaching and um, including her, her famous anti-racism seminar this year. Um, and when you talk to Ide about her research, uh, there's an excitement that she brings to both her environmental and social work that I feel is almost palpable. You can really feel it. And I think it comes from her intellectual curiosity, which she has about so many things like soil microorganisms and bees and ethnobotany and soil and molecular processes and food systems and a lot of things. And the passion she brings to her research is also comes from her lived experiences of disadvantage and systemic racism 
and her desire for a just world. She is a powerhouse researcher, and I'm so glad that she's being honored. As a distinguished SM graduate student speaker, I can't wait to hear her lecture. Uh, but first, uh, I'm going to pass it on to Tim, who has um, more things to say about her. Thank you so much, Claire. Thanks, Claire. It's such an honor um, to be here with Ide. Um, I first met Ide when I interviewed for this position, and then again a few months later before I'd actually started. And Ide had reached out um, to talk about kind of her early research ideas. And she was thinking about how mycorrhizal fungi might affect bees, might affect pollen and nectar and pollination visits and different types of agricultural systems. And I remember thinking at that point, like, wow, this is super ambitious, trying to connect all these below ground and above ground interactions, which are you know, tough to get at by themselves, all while looking at how management mediates them. She'll, she's definitely going to have to drop some parts of these questions, narrow down a little bit. But as you'll see, what, what the hell did I know? Um, you know, in the five years since then, um, I am so lucky to have gotten to know and frankly learn so much from Ide um, as a remarkable interdisciplinary and engaged scholar. Um, as Claire mentioned, a dedicated mentor to over two dozen undergraduate and high school students, um, often minoritized students coming from the Central Valley near where she grew up. Um, as an enthusiastic and supportive collaborator, collaborator and lab member, a critically constructive department community member. Um, it is not hyperbole to say that she is one of the rising stars in agroecology and soil microbial ecology. Um, just as an example, uh, last year she was on a panel that was, uh, or she served as one of six panelists for a seminar kind of on the, the history and evolution of agroecology. Um, she gave uh, just a compelling, personal, rigorous presentation that brought the house down. And there were several other longtime agroecological luminaries out there that, frankly, I was embarrassed for. Um, her list of accolades, grants, papers, and other academic markers is long. And she has, uh, as many of you may know, a UC Chancellor's postdoc and an awesome lab at UC Irvine ahead of her. Um, and yet she remains humble, uh, generous of her time, and doesn't take any shit as she tirelessly works to root out racism and other forms of oppression in academia and beyond. Um, and I think we are all honored uh, to have her as our distinguished ESPM graduate student speaker. So off to you, Ide. I'm trying not to cry. <laughs> I'm just starting off. Thank you so much, Tim and Claire. Oh my gosh. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna try to hold it back and do my presentation, but thank you too so much. I've been so lucky to have two co-advisors throughout this journey. Um, it's been, I've been truly lucky. Um, I think my dad's logged on, so we're good to go. <laughs> um, and then um, I think the rest of my family too. I saw my mom and my little brother earlier. Um, Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and get going. Oh, I, th I thought I wasn't getting emotional. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get started with my uh, talk. Uh, the lucky thing about SBOM is that we don't have to do defenses. <laughs> um, but this talk um, uh, hopefully brings together what I've been doing for my dissertation and some of my motivations. So everyone can see my screen. Okay, great. So um, like uh, people were battling it out in the chat. Um, I'll be talking about fungi and bees in the context of agricultural systems. Um, I really debated how to start this talk today um, because I think most ecologists that might work in agriculture, maybe they would start here with this image and tell you maybe how terrible agriculture is for the environment. And well, part of that's true. Um, I think another world's possible. And so um, this artwork here um, represents a lot of my personal and research motivations for the, today's talk. Um, it's a print by Ricardo Levens Morales. In the background, you see a coffee monoculture. It's sun grown. And in the foreground, you see a reimagining of this landscape, a diverse agroforest, a shade grown coffee. So today my goal is not just to talk about the bad things about agriculture, the negatives, but also talk about the possibilities and the joy that um, agriculture can bring. And I think the reason I think about this a lot has to do in part um, 
where I grew up and my family's history. I grew up in California, San oh my gosh. <laughs> I grew up in California, San Joaquin Valley in this like tiny little town, um, just north of Fresno with about like 5,000 people or so. And, um, you know, a lot of people think about the San Joaquin Valley as like the epitome of industrial agriculture and I was surrounded by this growing up. And I also like calling it the belly of the beast in terms of when we think about agriculture. And, you know, most people know of this area as just driving down I-5. Um, and I've actually seen a lot of really degrading maps calling the Central Valley stinky or just the part you drive by. Um, but for me, it's home. And my, my parents left Mexico um, to come here and work. Um, this is a picture of uh, where my family's from, which is a tiny little town again in Hidalgo, Mexico. And according to my dad, he came to the, uh, the San Joaquin Valley in a tiny town because uh, Florida was too humid and Washington was too cold. And so um, here's a picture of my dad coming home from work and they came to the San Joaquin Valley um, and my mom and my dad and they were farm workers growing up. And um, you know, it was a really um, illuminating experience to grow up surrounded by that. And yeah, and here's my sister and I uh, by the canal fishing. So growing up, I thought <laughs> canals were rivers and we would go fishing in them. It's a thing you do in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, but a lot of people also, um, you know, of you know, uh, the Central Valley as, you know, an agriculture powerhouse. Can people hear me still? I'm getting a frozen screen. Um, yeah, we're, we're hearing you. Okay, yeah. And so, um, and it's been, it prides itself in producing nearly 40% of the fruits and nuts consumed in the U.S. Um, but most of it looks like this. It's this is giant monoculture landscape of industrial production of fruits and vegetables. And and you know, while it's monocultures, yes, there's a lot of different things that are being produced here, like almonds and oranges, strawberries, walnuts, et cetera. Um, but most of it looks like this. Growing up, you would drive for a couple minutes and you'd still be in the same field. It's really, really big plots of land. And one of the things I miss most about where I grew up are these sunsets. Um, this photo is actually just right outside of where I grew up. And I've had so much nostalgia when I first went away to college for these dramatic sunsets. But as I learned through the years, um, the intensity of the colors is sometimes attributed to the pollution in the air. And so growing up, it's always made me wonder why such this like open landscape could be so polluted uh, because many people like myself, you know, got asthma and it was kind of this rite of passage. At one point, you know, you had asthma because of the air pollution. And so, you know, air pollution is one of the things that people bring up as an issue in San Joaquin Valley. Um, people also bring up the fact that natural habitats are nearly inexistent as monocultures have dominated this landscape in the past century. And that there's a number also of labor injustices get, that get that are prevalent in this region. Um, agriculture production in this area is also um, dependent on an irrigation system that's fickle to drought. And you probably see these signs a lot um, down I-5 of farmers wanting for water. And while perhaps comical from the Bay Area standpoint, there's actually a big issue. Um, and part of it has to do with the fact that, you know, here's actually a town, an aerial image of the town where I grew up and you see the rodeo where the Hattie Bale happens. And it used to flood a lot growing up and, um, but then it's, you know, stopped flooding less and, you know, drought became a big thing. And like I said, it has been a big issue in the area and some of farmers have had to abandon their fields. But I think I told you, I wasn't gonna just talk about the bad things about agriculture. And, um, and like I said, I know there's another type of agriculture possible and most of it is because my family reminds me of it. Here's two photos of where my family is and it's a plot of land that my family farms in Mexico. And here's uh, my dad and my uncles um, harvesting corn. And it's these, these corn that my family seeds that they've been growing for generations in this area in this you know, integrated corn and bean field. And every time you go, um, it's, it's, a, it's an event to be able to um, harvest this corn. But I'm also reminded of other farms, like this is a photo I took at Pie Ranch. Um, and you can see the little chickens in, intermixed with the, the vegetable farm there. And also this aquaponic system, it's managed by my friend's Leka sister in Hawaii. And it's such a reminder of how connected, we, how food is so connected to both the ocean and our land-based um, systems. So today, one of the guiding questions for my dissertation is how do we make agricultural landscapes work um, for people and the environment? And so for my dissertation and for this work, I decided to come back home. And so my dissertation has been mostly based out of the San Joaquin Valley. And it intersects um, these different components from soil, bees, farm management, and also understanding how we can support uh, farmers of color. 
And so throughout today's presentation, I'm gonna take you through a couple of different components. Um, one, I'm gonna look at how farm management affects um, uh, pollinators uh, above ground. But also I always, one of the reasons why I came to this like below to above ground is because I kept thinking when farmers implement a practice, it's not just affecting one group of organisms, it's affecting a lot of different organisms. So I'll also talk about how it affects AMF communities. And then I will uh, um, talk about how uh, connecting these two, the possible connections between these. And ultimately I'll talk about the effects of drought. I won't be able to cover every piece of this in detail. So you'll get sort of a snapshot of um, these different components of my research. And so, like I said, my research has been here in the Summit King Valley, and we know that this region is a big, giant agricultural powerhouse. But if you ever driven off, I, off of I-5 and you actually meandered into these roads, what you would find is these really small scale diversified farms. And they're um, embedded within this, this uh, landscape. And on these uh, farms, what you find is a number of different uh, crops being grown. Um, in this video here, um, uh, was shot by Wen Jing. It'll play in a moment. Um, and on these farms, what you find is a lot of um, mixed vegetable crops. You find around 50 to 100 different crops. And they're really diverse. It's from ginger, sweet potato, lemongrass. I've even seen papaya growing here. And even though these farms like represent such a small percentage, percentage of the landscape, it represents actually around 2,000 um, farmers. And so shout out to Wen Jing for shooting this video for me out in the field. And so who are the farmers? And I think this is important and I hope everyone holds this um, in their mind while I talk about the different parts of my research. The farmers uh, farming on these small uh, uh, pieces of land are predominantly immigrant refugee, refugee farmers who are farming, farming on land that's marginal and that it's been previously managed as monoculture. So they took some land that had been managed as monocultures and then uh, put in a really diverse cropping system. And just some beautiful photos of all the different crops to give you a visual of it. And then um, and you can see sort of bitter melon and lemongrass, et cetera. And um, here's also some maps that an undergraduate that worked with me uh, made where we uh, map by row by row which crop is growing. And so um, for my dissertation, I started to compare, you know, these monocultures to these polycultures. And part of it is that we know that simplifying landscapes negatively impacts biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. And that's important because a lot of the biodiversity um, depends on, uh, a lot of the ecosystem services that we need depend on this biodiversity. In an agricultural system, the biodiversity can both be above ground and below ground. So including pollinators, crop diversity, and below ground fungi. And so I was curious, what happens when you go the opposite direction? What happens when you go from a really simplified farming system to a more diverse farm in this, in this region? And, um, I decided, you know, especially in a region that's been uh, so heavily managed. So first, um, I decided to look above ground. So let's look at what's happening with the pollinator community. And specifically, I was curious uh, what the effect of diversifying farms um, would have on specialist bees. Because they tend to be some of the more rare um, groups of bees in landscapes. And I decided to focus on the squash, uh, squash bee uh, pollinator system. And, um, and the reason why is because squash has um, separate female and male flowers and people love gendering this, but basically what it means is that there's flowers with pollen and flowers that need to receive the pollen to be able to reproduce fruit. And the flowers have a really short window of time to be pollinated because they open really early in the morning, close by midday, and they're only open for one day. And so squash bees are actually a really good um, a pollinator of them because um, they're, they, open, they wake up really early in the morning um, to uh, be active. And if anybody's worked with pollinators, especially honeybees and an undergrad I worked with honeybees, and it's really nice working with honeybees because you don't have to go out in the rain because they don't like the rain. They're up at nine in the morning. So it's a really you know nice day. But squash bees are up at sunrise. They're up at really early in the morning. Um, but that's important because squash flowers open that early. And some of them even uh, sleep inside the squash flowers. And they're not doing this for nothing. The squash bees depend heavily on this pollen. And so, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things we came in is, uh, so then I decided to compare the monoculture and polycultures and someone on my qualifying exam committee were like, do you really think you'd find more squash bees on polyculture? And I was like, since the squash monocultures provide so much squash pollen. And I was like, oh, you might be right. And so I was like, okay, yeah, maybe mono squash monocultures might be really good for squash bees. And so we came in with the prediction that, 
you know, we would probably find tons of honeybees because they're everywhere. And we would find tons of squash bees on, on monocultures. But on polycultures, even though we find honeybees, we might find very little number of squash bees, but maybe tons of other wild bees. And so then we went out there and we did two sur we did surveys uh, across these farms really early in the morning and then later in the morning. And then we ran two transects across um, the field. And we find it's actually the opposite of what we expected. We find the crop diversification actually supports specialist pollinators. We find that there's a higher abundance of squash bees on polycultures. And we also find that as the surrounding agriculture land around polycultures increases, they support even more squash bees. And while not significant, we also found that squash bees, uh, uh, the amount of squash bees decreased on monocultures throughout the morning, but not on polycultures. And so to just recap really quickly, what we find is that um, we find tons of honeybees, and I'm not showing this data of, on, on, on monocultures and also on polycultures. And, but we actually don't find a lot of squash bees on, on monocultures, but tons more on polycultures. And we also find a, a, a greater number of wild bees. And so why might we find these results? Part of it might be because the polyculture farmers are planting squash over space and time. Um, you know, the monoculture farmers will plant squash once and then they'll rip it out and then there's no more squash for the bees. But squash, uh, but polyculture farmers might be planting squash, you know, every couple of weeks uh, throughout, um, throughout the year, going from summer to winter squash. The other thing is that squash bees not only need pollen, but they also need nectar. And so the polycultures might be supporting um, a greater diversity of nectar. And so now we know that, you know, farm management, farming for more crop diversity might support uh, pollinators. And next, um, we decided to look at the below ground communities. And specifically our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. And I really fell in love with these throughout my, my dissertation uh, research. They're um, symbiotic uh, fungi. And um, before I kind of give you more details, what you're seeing here is a stained root from one of my samples. And the little like darker bluer areas are AMF. And so they, they go inside the roots. Um, they've been around for a very long time um, since, the, uh, since plants gone to land. And part of it's because um, plants had a very limited root system and AMF helped them. And so um, in that way, they, so, they actually form a relationship with so many different plants. And they don't do it for anything. Um, they uh, get carbon in exchange for nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. But beyond nutrient uptake, they might. There are also evidence that they help, you know, drought tolerance, salt tolerance, um, heavy metals, um, and also pathogens, but with many other functions. And so, to answer a question about how crop, uh, how does managing for crop diversity affect AMF diversity? Uh, we sampled across monoculture and polyculture, specifically 31 farms, uh, 16 polycultures and 15 monocultures with about 375 samples. Um, we sampled uh, both uh, roots and soil, the soil specifically to determine AMF community composition. And we focused uh, particularly in eggplant because it was a crop we could find commonly across the different farms. And what we expected um, as we diversify farms is that we might see increased diversity and decreased diversity on the monocultures. Um, but there's different types of diversity um, when we think about it, when we have alpha, and so that refers to what's within a farm. And then we have beta diversity, what's, the, what's between farms, the diversity between farms. Another way to look at this is how many uh, are there and who's where. And so first we looked at just alpha diversity, comparing monoculture and polyculture, which, which are more diverse. And so we looked at richness, which is alpha diversity. And what we find is that uh, polycultures have nearly twice as many on average AMF. And this is important because as I mentioned, a lot of these polycultures had been previously monocultures. So it shows us that crop diversity can be key to sort of bolstering below ground diversity and supporting these multiple functions even in systems that have been previously managed intensively. Next, we decided who, who's where. So, you know, we know how many are there, but who's where and how does that uh, compare? And who's where can also be uh, uh, a way to think about this is what drives the community composition across an agricultural landscape. And what we know for some of the literature is, um, and this is a, adapted from a recent paper by Bala Chaudhry, is that the way AMF traveled throughout the landscape is that uh, tillage liberates these spores and then the spores are you know, flown across in aerially and then they're deposited uh, on the soil. 
and then um, then they land. And we still have some um, questions to uh, about how what determines the successful establishment of AMF, and so what determines who's where in our agricultural landscape. And so there's a number of different factors can affect AMF community composition, and especially within um, an agricultural landscape. One of them being the soil environment and, and farm management and geographic distance and the other being stochasticity. And so here you'll see in the next slides four different farms and I'll go through them. So first um, we decide, and then you also see these AMF spores. So um, first uh, we looked at, we could consider soil environment as a predictor. We know it, there's, uh, pH is a really well-known predictor for AMF community composition. And we might expect at different values of pH, we might expect different AMF communities. And the same could apply for different levels of phosphorus, nitrogen, and carbon. Or maybe perhaps farm management as a whole, regardless of the soil environment, might affect um, the community uh, composition across these farms. So in this case, we might find you know, similar communities at polycultures versus monocultures. Or actually, it might just have to do how close farms are, especially if they're moving across the landscape, uh, determining um, how, um, how similar the communities are. And so we might find more similar communities with farms that are closer uh, to each other. Or maybe none of these matter. And you know, AMF are just everywhere and there's not a really strong drivers uh, determining what's in the community. So um, to test this, in, uh, to partially test this, we use generalized dissimilarity modeling. And basically a tested relationship between community composition over different environmental gradients. And so what you'll see in the next slide is a plot that looks like this. Um, this y-axis is sort of a measurement of how different the AMF communities are, so changes in the AMF community composition or beta diversity. And then um, the x-axis is the standardized values of each variable that we tested, including ni uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, uh, and um, also spatial distance and crop diversity. And then you'll see some lines that look like this, and the shape of the line tells us how the change is happening. And so, um, you know, first looking at, uh, so, so the next plots will show sort of the predictors that emerge as significant. I'm not gonna show the curves of the, of the predictors that were not significant. What we find first is that geographic distance um, affects the community composition across both these farms, and that the changes are even more rapid or nearly linear for polycultures, whereas in monoculture it plateaus. So they become more similar as geographic distance increases. And then for the soil environment, we find that pH, which is already a known predictor, emerges as important. And in monocultures only, we see that changes in AMF plateaus with increasing phosphorus. And then um, looking at crop diversity only, so this is a, the number of crops on a polyculture. Obviously monoculture only has one crop, so we couldn't look at the changes. We find that AMF, uh, the differences in AMF for the heterogeneity in AMF community increases with crop diversity. So all together with alpha diversity and beta diversity, what we see is that polycultures could support a more diverse AMF community, and perhaps across the landscape over time could support even even more diverse community. So um, you know, this is what we see with um, farm management affecting AMF. But one of the main reasons why I even was really curious about looking at AMF, um, like Tim said, is because I was really interested in the way AMF might affect pollinator communities. And partially it's because we know that AMF communities help plants take up nutrients. And then we know if the plant, the plants goes to reproduce, they might allocate a lot of resources to the flowers for pollinators to come and visit them so that they can uh, pr reproduce fruit. And so to test this, um, we set up an experiment in the greenhouse and we grew plants with AMF and no AMF. And then we also grew these plants with low phosphorus and high phosphorus to test the effect that AMF had in the presence of very low nutrients. So if there's low nutrients, do AMF help the plants take up more nutrients? Or if there's high nutrients, do the AMF or do the AMF even help in those in that scenario? And so then we grew plants inside a greenhouse setting with, um, we grew squash plants like the, like we used in the field in the sterilized mixture. And then once it began flowering, we transferred these to a field setting. And we measured then a number of, of traits, including uh, floral traits, AMF and plant traits. And we also measured uh, pollinator visitation. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get fruit set. So uh, digging a little deeper into the measurements, um, 
we looked at biomass for plant traits. Um, we looked at AMF traits, hypholinked root colonization and spore count. And by root colonization hypholinked, what I'm referring to is root colonization is how much of the AMF is inside the roots. And hypholinked is how many um, of these thread-like extensions of AMF are in the soil, which are the nutrient transportation system. And then we also measured a number of flora traits uh, relating to nectar, pollen, and even the size of the flower. And then we took, we uh, kept track of how many bees were visiting these plants. So first we decided to look, okay, were, did our treatment, were our treatments effective? Did we see an effect on these different traits? And so in the next slides, you'll see um, a dot that would denote that uh, one of these treatments had a significant effect, and then the color will refer to these different treatments. What we first find um, is that AMF um, had an effect on nectar volume, pollen protein, and number of flowers. So when AMF was present, um, the volume of nectar and the amount of protein was larger and even the size of the flowers. And as expected, we saw an effect of, of AMF on hypho and root colonization when it was present. And then we also saw that plants that were inoculated with AMF had a greater number of visits. We also saw that nutrient treatment affected um, the size of the flowers and also, as expected, the root colonization and hypholink. And that's because, you know, the uh, plants might not uh, colonize, uh, AMF might not colonize plants when there's a lot of nutrients. And then we also find an interaction, as expected, with our AMF traits. But the goal was to try to bring this all together. And so we use a structural equation model but basically we tested the indirect pathways between all these different traits um, in the model. And we, then we dropped the, the pathways that were insignificant. And so the ones that are grayed out are things that emerge as insignificant when we correlated all these things together. And then we saw that the number of visits was uh, especially driven by flower size. So the bigger the flower, the more number of visits. But we also observed that the size of the flower was uh, correlated with hypholinked and root colonization, but in opposite direction. So as there was more hypholinked, so what helps the AMF take up nutrients, the bigger the flower, but the more root colonization in the roots, the smaller the flower, perhaps indicating some trade-off with the, the size of the flowers and the plant allocating carbon to the AMF. And so together we find that pollinator visitation is AMF mediated, especially via flower size. And you know, what does this mean in the context of, of the different research I've been doing? Um, one, we know that on-farm diversification can support specialist pollinators, that crop diversity might increase the AMF communities in, even in farms that had been intensively managed, and that pollinator visitation might be driven by AMF. Um, and so together, it, it sort of indicates in a small part that agroecosystems are dependent on this below and above ground diversity. And so, you know, that together takes us to a little small step forward about understanding how we can make ag agricultural landscapes work for the environment and people. But as I indicated in, this, in the region I've been working in, drought has been a big um, factor. And in particular, um, the last major drought, um, a lot of people were like, you know, our farm's going to survive in the area. And so, um, you know, ecologically speaking, uh, there's evidence that increasing diversification like, like polycultures might bolster the ecological resilience of farms. For example, AMF helps plants deal with tolerance. And so one might expect that ecologically diversified farms might persevere in the face of drought. So we tested this by documenting agriculture land use change uh, through the last major drought um, uh, by documenting both the presence of polycultures in the different crop types. And what we find is that as droughts increase with climate change, diversified farms are per persevering less. In fact, we see almost nearly a fourfold decrease, whereas the different uh, crops either stay the same or increase, like uh, fallowing as expected, but almonds and grapes water intensive cro crops increase throughout the drought. And actually, um, the graph not shown here, polycultures actually switched. When polycultures were lost, they were switched over to almonds or grapes. And so I started off with saying, I hope you remember the farmers. And so uh, a lot of the farmers are predominantly immigrant and refugee farmers. And so on these farms, I think the research has shown that they provide these ecological benefits, but drought is a much more than just like an ecological phenomenon. It's also social and it's a socioeconomic problem in California, especially in the Silicon Valley. And so when we're thinking about um, 
supporting uh, farms that can be more resilient to droughts, we also need to address these socioeconomic factors so we can support more resilient agricultural systems. And so this is kind of bringing me towards the end of my, um, my presentation. Um, and just briefly, it, um, this research has been a big motivating factor for my future research. Um, um, I'll be doing uh, postdoc research and trying to look at how AMF helps plants cope with drought with uh, Kathleen Treesitter at UC Irvine. Um, but I also um, wanna, this, this part of this project also reminds me, like I said, there's a lot of need to support uh, small scale farmers of color. And I was actually really um, fortunate to work with um, Ruth Douglas Willard and Michael Yang for a lot of this research. And you know, there's a, a big props to them for allowing me to um, uh, work with them and wanting to collaborate. But also, you know, I mentioned that the farmers were having a hard time with drought, but this team down in the, in the San Joaquin Valley and specifically in the Fresno area has done an incredible job supporting these farmers. And I'm incredibly thankful for that. And of course, I'm so thankful for all the farmer participants who um, allowed me to come make holes in their fields and um, you know, sample all the bees in the area and, um, and trusted me with um, doing research. Um, it honestly like, it, it yeah, it, it, it made my, it made this completely worthwhile to be able to look at this and also to shine a different light in the Simon King Valley and shine a, a light at different groups of farmers supporting this. I also really want to thank um, all the undergraduates and high school students who have helped me. Um, like none of this research at all, at all would have been possible without them. Here's just like a select few of the photos and um, just like from, you know, sampling in the field to the greenhouse experiment to lab work to um, everything. Um, there's actually a photo here in the corner. I really wanted to put this one. Um, one of the farmers uh, for some reason or another decided, you know what, I'm done with this field. I'm gonna till it tomorrow morning. And I was like, shoot, so, okay, we're not gonna be able to sample anymore. And then um, the, under, the undergraduates and uh, working with me, they're like, I was like, the only way we can, the, the, they're like, no, we should go there. We should go as early as possible to be able to sample. And I was like, well, we'd have to get there at three in the morning. And so they woke up at two in the morning and we drove out and they were the ones like, we're gonna do it. And so here's them like sampling with a, like a headlamp um, for us to collect um, samples for the field work. And so, yeah, truly exceptional. Like it, it's, it's been the highlight um, of my dissertation to work with them and yeah. And like in making friends, like here's them with face masks, our, our self-care after the field. Um, here's um, um, Paulina and Adela. Uh, they were the first high school students to work with me on nearly five years ago. And even just like last year I ran into into one of them at UC Davis and I hadn't seen her in five years and she was working on someone else's research project at Davis. And it's just been so much fun. Like they've kept my spirits up this entire time. And so thank you all so much. Um, also, I wanna thank my incredible mentors and advisors. Um, I, I, I'm such a big proponent of mentorship and I don't know if my undergraduate mentors are here, but Juan and Christelle, like without them, I wouldn't have fun to do a PhD and also Claire and Tim and obviously the, my whole lab, um, labs, <laughs> Kremlin lab and the Bowles lab. Um, I, like I said, I've been so lucky to have two labs throughout this journey and um, the Firestone lab before Tim came, um, I'm gonna admit I'd never worked with soil before starting my PhD at all. I never used an auger. And then Rena from the Firestone lab, I asked her if I could use an auger, not knowing exactly how I was gonna use it. And then she so kindly just said, you want me to show you how to use it? And then she sat with me and just like showed me. And then it just became this, uh, like such an immense source of support from Rena and Anna just showing me all these methods and getting me started. And without them, like, I just wouldn't have been able to do this. And of course my uh, dissertation committee, including Mary and Britt and Kathy, and Kathy has been such a big source of emotional support in all our long rides doing interviews and um, talking shit about everything. Uh, thank you so much, Kathy. I also want to thank my family so much. Um, gracias. Yeah. Here's my siblings. So as you can tell, they're a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun together. And I have a big family. Here's my little brother. Um, he was really young when he started. He was like two years old when I started my PhD, and now he's seven years old. And 
I especially want to thank my parents, um, my mom and my dad. I showed this photo because my dad, like, one time he drove up randomly and he brought this big box of nopales and cantaloupe and he just started peeling them for me and he showed up in my living room so that I could have nopales and cantaloupe and like, and his friend showed up and they just spent like an afternoon cleaning nopales for me in my living room so that I would have some food from, from their home. And my parents have been just an incredible amount of support, you know, like they're the reason why I've done all of this and like the source of inspiration why I decided to work on agriculture and they're an inspiration um, for everything. So thank you so much. I don't want to cry more. And then I want to thank also my friends from the get-go, like um, Erica has been my friend since I've been eight years old and just stuck with me through all my shenanigans and my friends from undergrad, Deanna, who's also doing a PhD and we've been through this together. And, you know, here like two, two kids who had never been out to an arboretum, you know, in, in college and doing it together and it's been amazing. And also all the incredible support I received through my PhD. It was really hard in the beginning, but all these people on these, on these photos came out and supported me. Leka here has his calls tomorrow, so please send out good energy. Uh, he was an undergraduate working with me when he first started out and he's become one of my closest friends uh, throughout this process. And here's like, here's him saying like, so like, like here we need, he's mad about us not having more agroforestry systems. And all the, I, all the other people in here, um, that I've just like been there and just like, um, yeah, just told me I could keep going when I felt like I couldn't. And even Alexander showed up two nights ago to make sure I had my presentation done. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, thanks to Rodolfo. <laughs> here's some of his graduation, my, my undergraduate graduation. And here's a photo of him in the lab, always waiting for me to finish things. <laughs> Oh, he's right there on the side and it's just been you can see his energy just it's been so so wonderful and so gentle through all of it but i wanted i wanted not to cry so i just wanted to end on all the dogs in my life so people could have an uplifting thing and i have a lot i have two dogs now i wouldn't know one you and here's all thank you all the dogs have been in my life throughout my phd um thank you and you know funding and stuff Thank you. <laughs> great job, great job. Beautiful talk, simple, I mean simple. <laughs> you made it simple for us. That's what I loved about it. You're a great communicator. Thank you so much. Um, I started with, a, it's so, I feel bad about asking this question because it's really technical, but um, D did you consider looking at the, the abundance of vesicles in the roots as opposed to arbuscules to determine the, the, the efficacy of the symbiotic relationship? Yeah, we did. We counted the different structures as well, the total root colonization and different structures, but for that simplicity. Did, uh, that didn't pan out? Um, no, it didn't pan out as, as a thing. Um, yeah, but there's sort of an idea that like these different structures might indicate different functions for AMF, but we did test those, yeah. Maybe something that you can uh, look more on into yeah. your drought study. I'm yeah. sure, thank you so much. Yeah. You wanna read the questions from the chat or do people wanna ask the questions? I, I, don't, I don't know if I can see all the- I think everybody's just <laughs> congratulating you. So maybe we can open the floor to questions. <laughs> thank you all so much. <laughs> it feels really surreal like it feels so surreal like I don't know Erica who's in the audience I don't know if she ever imagined me <laughs> um I never when I was in yeah I never imagined myself if you were to ask a high school I, I would have never imagined myself being here it's surreal by the way you had uh, over 180 attendance 185 uh, <laughs> I've organized the seminar for 10 years and this is the highest number we've ever had. So for you to know. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Questions for ID, please? It works out. And I went over time, so sorry. Oh no, it's good time. Oh, huh? No, you're, you're perfect <laughs> in time too, that too, you know? Uh, 
Okay, we have three three hands up. I think I don't know that I don't know to do that, but you don't know to do that, right? Either. Yeah, go for it. I'll just do the first one, Ted. Hey, fantastic talk! Thanks so much for sharing um, such a rich picture of your research experience. Can you can you guys hear me? Um, I was curious about the results that you were showing um, of the drought effects on diversified farming, and I'm just curious if um, even just anecdotally, uh, to what extent access to water um, played a role in those transitions and what appears to be sort of a lack of resilience among these smaller diversified farms, when in fact it seems to be probably quite intertwined with issues around access to, to, to water. Yeah, so we did, um, obviously I can't, I can't show everything. Um, I'm just like, I looked at my thing, I was like, what the hell did I do with my PhD? But yeah, so we also did um, interviews with farmers. And what we found is that, yes, of course, the access to, and so I forgot to mention this, access to being able to dig incredibly deep Incredibly emotional, well. and you know, she's thanking everyone, and she's crying, and then like two white dudes get on. And hey, up, go. Really questions. Oh, Brainy, you're on. You're, um, on. you're not on mute, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. That's my brother. Um, uh, what's it called? Um, yeah, so we did interviews and a lot of it had to do with like being able to access to dig deeper wells. And these wells are super expensive in this area to dig deeper wells. And some of the time, like they're renting land. So the farmers are able to um, like convince the landowner or the landowner, like I heard some uh, from some technical assistants say like, oh, the land landowners would rather make more money having someone grow almonds for them than keep renting it out to polyculturists. And so um, the word resilience, like I think when, like, we need to be careful with that. I think like ecologically speaking, and I think I wanted to show this and I was uh, this part of my research because as ecologists, we might go in and be like, yes, let's diversify systems, but we really can't forget all these socioeconomic factors. And like, you know, it, 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 all, it always has surprised me why farmers decided to grow more almonds throughout the drought, even if it was a really water intensive crop. And part of it is because they would make more money. And so I think when we're thinking about sort of solutions to the climate crisis, we really need to think about um, who we're trying to support. And some people might just make decisions out of capitalistic gains. And so, um, yeah, there was a number of other factors. And um, part of the research I want to do in my postdoc is to actually test these ideas of drought and ecological resilience. But I think it's much more than that. It's it's a social like it's a social thing. Yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. I lost track of people. I, um, it looks like Zoe Fortman, you had your hand up. I'm not sure if you had a question. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, Louis Fortman. Louis? Oh, ah, yes, here I am. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. That was fantastic. <laughs> My socks flew across the living room. Um, <clears throat> I was curious. So you, first of all, you did what looked like incredibly intensive data collection of, of, of biophysical data. And then you, on top of that, went around and interviewed farmers, which is also a whole lot of work. Oh, okay. How would you oh, tell um, the, your students that you're going to have about okay. why it is or isn't important to do both biophysical and social and how they can prepare themselves to do that? Yeah. Um, so I've had a lot of people like, all right, so I kind of want to, there's multiple things that come to mind. One, a lot of the research that I'm able to do comes from basic research, too. like doing these really deeply mechanistic types of studies. And so that's not to discount like that type of research. But at the same time, I think, especially if you're working in agricultural systems, or even just in the outside, like there's this paper that came out recently that said, you know, and like, nature has always been influenced by humans like it's always been influenced and so but let's zoom into agriculture agriculture is like inherently uh, like a social system um but what i would tell students is like I th one i don't want students to feel like they have to do all of it but they have to maybe be good collaborators and maybe contextualize their researcher including um you know who they decide to work with i think that was really important to me in my phd like um you know uh the farmers I work with represent such a small group of the farmers, but it was really important to me to work with the group of farmers. They reminded me of my parents and, you know, they were immigrants themselves. And so you can do ecological research by situating in this, in this like social political context or um, 
So that's what I would say. I think either collaborating with someone or just situating if you're thinking about as an ecologist. But um, yeah, I don't want any student to feel like they need to do it all. Um, it This type of work uh, requires multiple people. And my mom always says, dos cabezas trabajan mejor que una. So two heads work better than one. And so, um, yeah, that's what I would tell them. And thank you to your parents for setting you on this path. They're the best. <laughs> Um, I could continue being a moderator, moderator here. Uh, That's my brother. Uh, so, uh, you can think, but you can have my job too. <laughs> uh, so look, uh, looks like the next person on cue was Phoebe Parker Shames. Thank you, Jimmy. Hey, Dave, that was fantastic. Just uh, the beautiful exemplification of like everything I think ESPM strives to do. Um, so thank you so much. It was beautiful moving, um, inspirational, fascinating, all of the superlatives. Um, I had sort of two questions. One, did you make all of your own like drawings and like graphics? Cause they were amazing. Um, and then the second is, so you've done a really beautiful job laying out sort of why these farms are so important and also how even amidst sort of the stressors that we need them for, they're th threatened um, and in decline. Do you have sort of thoughts or insights into how to help support or protect these farms and their farmers? Uh, so your first question, yes. <laughs> um, I really like drawing in general and um, yeah, I like helping communicate. And I think part of the goal for today is like, at least hopefully my family understands part of my research. Um, but um, yeah, so, and I think this like this like phenomenon of like small scale farms, like it's like happening. And, like one of the reasons why, uh, it, what it reminds me of is like, um, my parents used to farm in Mexico and like they weren't able to continue doing that. And so even though they're farming this really diverse system, like they got pushed off the land. And so that's happening around the world. I feel like that dynamic, um, but in terms of trying to support farmers, I mean, I just feel like I have generic answers like policy, you know, and I think part of it is also like, um, you know, people who are ecologists, like, again, I, I just keep, one of the things I keep thinking about, especially for agroecology, it really matters who you work with when you're working with agriculture. And so if we're just not working with these farmers and contextualizing and providing sort of this information about what the, uh, the importance of these farmers, I think that's important. Um, but policy, like one thing I've been really curious, like, I think there's a lot of like, um, we're taking a soil health seminar this uh, semester that Tim is leading. And there's been a lot of questions about like, oh, you know, like how do we measure carbon? Like how do we measure it so that farmers can get paid? And I've just been thinking like, if we're just gonna pay farmers by carbon, like why can't we just pay farmers for the practices they're doing? But I don't have a good answer for you, Phoebe, um, in that, and it's something, um, yeah, I, I would also wanna know uh, how we can. But uh, one, oh, one thing, is I work with uh, Ruth and Michael and they're incredible and they manage this, this, the small farms, uh, small farms advisor down there. But part of it, one of the things I talk to Ruth a lot is like there needs to be more like money to support these positions across California and there's only a few farm advisors. But I recently saw that there's money now going towards both like more small farms advisors, but also um, uh, outreach, uh, outreach um, uh, uh, assistance. And so, um, I think that type of funding, directing that type of funding to towards that, it's also important. Like, I like the infrastructural support to be able to support these farmers. Yeah. And then, I think oh. it looks like Alexis Shujakobi had the next question, or if, if Phoebe didn't have any other questions. Hi, Ade. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. It was amazing. Um, and thank you so much for your work. It's all incredibly amazing and super inspirational. And um, I. Like I'm about to start my PhD and I want to be just like you. Um, so I, I was wondering how you went about um, integrating so many different methods into your research trajectory and like especially how did you get um, farmers and like community participants to like weigh in on your research and the kinds of questions that um, they wanted to ask and especially like coming in, like I know that you grew up in the Central Valley and like had like probably connections because it was like an area that you were familiar with, but like also like acknowledging that like UC Berkeley and like a lot of like powerful 
academic institutions have like this like inherent like power dynamic with um, traditional knowledges that can sometimes and like historically has been exploitative. So like, how have you dealt with um, translating um, like community needs and community engagement into like a kind of colonial academic space and like science, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer it. And I know you're from the Central Valley too, <laughs> right? So yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I, I think the first part you were talking about, like how like this research could come and be. So um, uh, part of it was forming a partnership with Ruth on the, and with her, like it kind of gets a little bit of sort of what you're saying at the end. And we had a lot of conversations like, like for almost a year before like sort of like um, the farmers she was working with and like the questions we wanted to ask, like we kind of spent like a year sort of like going back and forth and like figuring out this, uh, like the project and then, um, and I remember her saying like, um, she didn't want like, a, like, she didn't want it to, like, she didn't want questions like extractive or like ethnobotany and like, I love ethnobotany, but like no ethnobotanical like questions linking, you know, um, different things like that. And that like, that's, that's, um, that's something I, that we definitely talked about, but um, you know, I think even just when I think about my PhD research, I still just think it's a small, piece like I don't think it gets fully even to like unpacking like sort of like colonial like structures of science and all these different things like so much like I just it's a small part and part of it is because um, I definitely came to this first from like a biodiversity conservation so I wanted to measure biodiversity and sometimes I tell people I spend my PhD just counting like shit like I just kept counting stuff like all the time just counting how many bees are there I'm counting how many AMF are there and it like and even throughout my PhD, I was like, oh, like, I feel like I'm not able to like say something um, beyond that. And so um, that's what I'll, I will say. Like, I think part of the research that I've done like shows like here's some ecological importance, but in terms of being like, like, what do I tell the farmers? Do I tell the farmers like, hey, you have more AMF diversity, you know, like that still takes a while. So even myself, I feel like the question you're asking, like I'm still asking myself that question and like, knowing how to do that work better and moving forward to be able to ask these questions. Um, um, yeah, so that's how I would answer that. But I think, um, like I said, I think it, it matters who you work with. And, um, and I've, I've had some incredible collaborators and partners in, in the field for that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, one, one last question for a day. Mary Kimball, I'm not sure if you had a question, but you mentioned in the chat that if you had a chance to ask a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Ade, and I'm so glad I don't, I'm going to start crying too, so I won't, I'll just stop with all of the accolades because you're amazing and you know I think you're amazing. For all of you who don't know me, I've known her since she was in high school and she was in a program of ours at the Center for Land-Based Learning and Claudia Sersland says hello, your farms coordinator. She's so proud of you. And she says she remembers seeing the passion in your eyes at the Kearney Ag Station when you had yeah. a field day there. And so I think I love that this has kind of come back around, right, to all of your work um, in that region and with UC and with small farm advisors. It's just, it's, it's awesome. But what I wanted to ask you about and tell you about is that if you haven't already met with Assemblyman Robert Rivas, He's the chair of the Ag Committee right now. He started last year as chair of the Ag Committee. He's from the Salinas Valley. And he is he's the author, and there's a whole lot of co-authors on a bill that I know that you're going to be super excited about. And I feel like you, with your passion and with your storytelling and with your ability to tell this how important these things are to people, uh, he, he's going to want to talk to you. So the 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 uh, the it's called AB or Assembly Bill 125, the equi the Equitable Economic Recovery, Healthy Food Access, Climate Resilient Farms, and Worker Protection Bond Act. So if this gets and it's already passed out of AG in a bipartisan way, which is amazing. It's now going to natural resources. If it goes all the way, it would be a bond on the ballot, okay? Wow. 
And so going back to that, like storytelling and what you've done and how incredible and how important it is to support those small farmers, right? That's going to be a big part of this bond. So let me help you. If you don't know about it, let me help you introduce to yes. him uh, and let me help you get involved because I think that all of the things that you've done so far with the research and the work that you're going to continue to do is going to help him tell that story as well. Thank so, you so much, Mary. Congratulations. Thank I'm you. so proud of you. Take me full circle to high school. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. That sounds incredible. Cool. Work. Congratulations. You did a great job. And um, thank you so much for being at Berkeley. Thank you so much for the passion you have. Uh, I didn't know much of what you did, but I have, uh, <laughs> I'm super impressed. And also all of us really uh, want to thank you and congratulate you on, on, the, on the honor that you received, to fully deserved. I like to remind everybody that next week we have another spectacular person talking, Stephanie Carlson, and she is the distinguished faculty lecturer. So please, uh, let's see who wins between the two. Who's going to get more people? <laughs> um, Mateo. Could you, yes. leave, if you close the room, could you leave me as host so that some people can stay behind? Yes, I can do that. Um, I can do that. I'll put you as host and then leave, okay? And, and I'll, I'll, I'll have to stop the recording though, okay? Is that okay. all right? Okay. All right, so again, I hope to see everybody next week. Um, same place, same time for the, the next Distinguished Lecture. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. You know, I think I saw Juan in the room. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> My dad's in his truck with this. <laughs> Hola, Papa. <laughs> is my mom still here? Uh, yeah, she is either. Or she was. Or she's still here. She's still here. Oh, yeah, she put a little dog, of course. Yeah. So I know, I don't know who's going to stay behind, but I know Juan wanted to do something. It's my brother, Mike. It's my mom. There's Kaden. <laughs> Hola, Kaden. Juan said his audio doesn't work either. Oh. Yeah. The recording's still going. Oh, Mateo. Stop it.